so I'm at Maui Lion everywhere. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, like all the places. <coughs> I'm a member of SigHonk, which is a security-minded group that is actually focused on doing talks about container security and things like that. You may have seen me present with Ian Coldwater, Rory McCune, and Brad Thiesman. They're great friends. They're not here at the security conference, unfortunately, but they are, they are here. In my mind, today, we're going to be doing this. So isogo.2, that's our uh, URL shortener, and then slash sailing the seas. So open a browser, can be Chrome, can be whatever kind of browser you want, and go there. That's step one. When you get there, it should look something like that. So again, the URL, iso, as in isovalent, go to go.2, clear enough, slash sailing the seas. When you get there, go ahead and hit start on that lab. And hopefully we won't have to wait too long. I did actually do a hot start for this, so there should be a good little pool of you know, reasonably, reasonably started episodes, but see how it goes. But while we're waiting for everything to load up here, you can also choose this little arrow key, and it will take you through a little bit more information about it, right? Like what is security observability? We're going to be leveraging Tetragon. It's a standalone project, so Cilium and Tetragon are related, but they're not entirely, um, they're not entirely uh, inclusive of each other. You can run Tetragon by itself on servers. You can also run Tetragon inside of your Kubernetes clusters, and it can make use of some of the data that, um, so that Cilium also sees. Here's a kind of an overview in a graphical format of like what Tetragon does. When I'm introducing Tetragon, usually I say, like, you know, Cilium is primarily a networking product. It's focused on being able to provide the networking abstraction inside of Kubernetes. It's focused on being able to provide network policy, being able to like, help you do things like actually limit the access of particular applications within your Kubernetes environments to other applications or even to the outside world. Whereas Tetragon, instead of being focused primarily on networking, Tetragon is focused primarily on the Linux kernel. So pretty much anything, if you were to think of the a of Linux kernel as an API or event-driven uh, API, right? When I open a file, that's an API call. When I open a socket, that's an API call. With Tetragon, we're able to basically insert, insert ourselves into any of those API calls and take metadata out of them. We're able to gather information about what actually happened at runtime. We're able to enforce things. We're able to change the way that behaviors happen, again, at that Linux kernel layer. And in this episode, in this uh, session that we're doing here today, we're going to play with it. We're going to play with that a bit. So there are some timeouts, but I don't think they'll affect us today. This lab will exist for three days. You have today, tomorrow, and the next day to play with this, and then it will go away. But there are plenty more labs available. If you do want to explore more uh, labs after you get done with this one, because you find they're fun and you want to get badges and that kind of stuff, if you go to isovalent.com. slash labs, you will find a whole library of labs, some of which will give you a badge that you can actually put up on your social media and say that you have taken the time to learn about all kinds of things. The lab that we're exploring today is roughly based on the Getting Started with Tetragon lab, but the lab we're using is not going to give you a badge. So <clears throat> when you see that blinking Start button, go ahead and click Start. If you are, are just joining us, the um, URL to go to is, you can just open your laptop and browse to isogo.2 slash sailing the seas. And it will bring you to the lab that we're about to explore. isogo.2 slash sailing the seas. So the first part I want to show you is the actual docs for this, because we've actually just put up a doc site it's tetragon.io. It actually has a lot of really great content in it. If you want to explore or understand how to interact with Tetragon, this is a great first step. So if you just want to play with the project, understand what it's doing, like engage with it, uh, even you know, put up a talk of your own around Tetragon, there's a ton of content here on the website, including documentation and a link to the GitHub. 
And in the GitHub, all of these examples and everything else are also here. You can obviously recognize that uh, image that we just kind of went over. But there's great getting started guides. You know, how do we actually get started on Linux? How do we get started in Kubernetes, et cetera, et cetera. So but definitely check out the uh, documentation and, the, um, and those sorts of things. Now, in our continuing down from here, the very next section here on the right, we can see it says Tetragon, Zox, and Repo. We've kind of explored that a little bit. And then just down below that, it says Install Tetragon. That's where we're going to get started. We're going to actually be using a single node kind cluster for this. So we're just going to go ahead and kind of get started with that. So you can actually, these things on the right are clickable. So depending on how much typing you actually want to do or how much mousing around you want to do, you can do this with your, um, you know, by clicking between the tabs. Or you can also just click on in tab terminal one. And then in the text, you have choices. You can again kind of just hit run. You can hit copy, or you can type it in, depending on what you want to see. So like I said, this is a single node kind cluster. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to install um, Tetragon into it. Tetragon, being a project that is co-hosted effectively with Cilium, we're going to be adding the Cilium Helm repo to our Helm installation. And then we're going to be using that Cilium Helm repo to install Tetragon into our Kubernetes environment. One of the important flags here is that I'm actually also pointing the um, configuration to deploy into the kube system namespace. And then there is a Tetragon YAML that describes the configuration of Tetragon. And if we wanted to look at that, you can actually vim it and see it's really pretty simple. I'm not really going. I'm not really going too crazy with like what's configured here, but really, it gives us an export log. Or it gives us an export file name that we're going to create. It's watching for particular process credentials that are available. It's watching for the namespace that processes are in. It's not denying anything. It's not allowing anything. It's just you should be able to see all the events that are happening. We're not enabling the Cilium API because we don't have Cilium deployed in this cluster. Just Tetragon. And then this last piece is the BTF piece. And I'm going to spend just a minute on this to help you understand. This is actually a very important thing as it relates to eBPF. This is how eBPF works. Who here has used GDB in the past? Yeah, a little bit. You've heard of it? Like, could I hum a few bars? So the way GDB works, right, is you might have an application. And you want to be able to like insert breakpoints and kind of understand what's happening at that application, at that point in the application. But to really kind of understand what's happening in some of these applications, you need debug symbols. You need the symbols that actually allow you to understand, OK, this function, which from the application perspective might look like an integer, is actually this particular logical function within the flow of the code. And those debug symbols help you map what's actually happening at runtime to something that is a little bit more human readable. Ironically, that's exactly how BTF data works with the Linux kernel. right? So there's a bunch of work that we've done as isovalent and in the eBPF community in general to basically enable BTF data to be made available in every running Linux kernel today. So every popular Linux distribution that's out there, if you look at this path, slash sys, slash kernel, slash BTF, you're going to find a file like that, VM Linux. And that is the debug symbols that help us navigate that kernel API that I talked about. Right? So when I say file open, <laughs> If I'm doing it with like a program inside of, the, uh, inside of a Linux user space and I say file open, it basically shows up in the Linux kernel as an integer call. Right? Sys call 27. Great. What is 27? And what is 27 as it relates to like an ARM architecture? And what is 27 as it relates to an older kernel? And what is 27 as it relates to, I mean, you could see how all of this would very, very much change. And so shipping the symbols as part of the kernel now allow us to say, whenever I see file open, and then we can actually map in that BTF data, which, oh, simple that is. What are you doing? You got a break when you're hired. There's no sleeping. All right. Um, <clears throat> that helps us understand those functions that we actually want to write uh, code for, right? So when you're writing uh, Cilium, when you're writing Tetragon policy, you could say, I want to I watch for the system call file open, 
this is how we understand how to understand what's happening at that kernel layer. For the most part, this is, up, this is hidden from you. I don't think most people are actually ever going to see this. But when you start playing with Tetragon and you start like really understanding like all the different things that are capable that we're capable of inside in that kernel space, things get a little more interesting. So I'm gonna empty, I'm gonna leave this file. Oh, I already did. All right. And then I'm gonna run this last command on this page which is understanding whether Tetragon was successfully deployed. And you should see something that says Tetragon successfully rolled out. Welcome. Right now, we're kind of in the first step of the lab. If you want to join us in this lab, this is the URL to go to to get started. It's open up a browser and go to isogo.2 slash sailing the seas. And that will take you directly to the lab that we have begun. Or you could just watch me fumble about and do that instead. <coughs> when you're done with that example, you can hit check. <coughs> and if all things are successful, it will move you to the next step in the lab. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to explore the XZ vulnerability. Now, I'm not sure if you've heard about this one, but it was an interesting one because you know, a clever socially engineering kind of attack was uh, brought to fore in a GitHub repository that holds one of the core util one of the core libraries in Linux called libLZMA, right? And so, in in the XZ project, like somebody figured out if they could actually inject code into that project that was shipped as part of the binary, then they could further, when that when that library was being used by SSH, open a back door that allows for like an exploit that would be mind-blowing, right? Because if this actually ever came to production, this would actually mean that like every instance of SSH using this particular vulnerable version of the, of the LZMA library would be backdoored. Everybody would, you know, the, the attacker would be able to basically just connect via SSH and get access to those servers worldwide. Fortunately, some enterprising soul figured out uh, and he actually, he says that he determined it because the, <laughs> the, uh, and I, I, this blows my mind. He was doing some testing, doing some performance testing. He was initiating an SSH session to a vulnerable version of this. And he was like, wow, it's like taking milliseconds longer. There's got to be something wrong. And I'm like, you are kidding me. Like, you noticed that it was taking milliseconds longer. And so you were like, oh, I wonder, I wonder, I'm gonna go look at the library and see like where the problem is. Like, and actually discovered this whole like thing. If you get into the drama of this, it's mind blowing. Like that this person actually even found it, one, and second of all, was able to actually to, to show how this works. Yeah, absolutely mind blowing, yeah. So <clears throat> we're going to basically kind of show uh, we're going to create a vulnerable kubelet, and we're going to kind of play with that vulnerable kubelet, and then show how Tetragon can understand that a vulnerable library is being used by SSH. So let's get started here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to exec into our control plane in terminal one. So again, you can click on that terminal one, you can hit run here, and now we basically exec into the control plane. Now the thing that's interesting about this is because it's a kind Kubernetes cluster, kind stands for Kubernetes and Docker. This means it's running as a Docker container. That's why I can use Docker exec to get into that server or that kubelet that's running over there. This kubelet is also running systemd, right? So it's like running systemd inside of a container on top of a container. Like you get the idea, it's crazy. So the next thing we're gonna do now that we're of exec in here is that we're actually going to pull down a vulnerable version of the, lib, of the lib LZMA library that I was referring to. And then we're gonna install it because we're crazy like that. Now the good part about this is that when I do this install, um, it's actually going to what it's going to do is it's actually going to install the vulnerable version of libLZMA, and then we're going to install SSH as well, 
And because there's already a version of libLZMA that is compatible with SSH, apt is going to leave it alone. Right? So apt is like, sure, you got your library. It's in there. I don't have to change anything about that. There's no dependency problem. I'm going to go ahead and install SSH. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use systemctl command to start SSH so that we can SSH into it. And then we're going to exit that exec process in the container itself. So there was a lot of text that went by. All of that text was basically just installing all of the other dependencies for SSH, not related to the libLZMA one. The next thing we're going to do is we're just going to copy our authorized keys from the host into the container. And what that does is it makes it so that we can use passwordless SSH to get into the container. So from here, the next thing we want to do, actually, let me get a raise of hands. How many people are where I am? Sweet. All right, good, good. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to click this little down arrow here, and we're going to move on to the next piece of it. So now that we have a vulnerable version of SSH and libLZMA running, we're going to write a policy that allows us to catch when that vulnerable version of the library is being used. You can click on the word editor and click on that policy, and we can kind of see what's actually happening at this layer. So I'm going to walk through this with you, just so you understand what's happening. But in front of you, you have, a, you have a tracing policy that's going to be used to determine when an SSH binary is being called. And as part of the call of that binary, it's going to pull in or load from disk a vulnerable version of the libLZMA library. We know that the vulnerable versions are libLZMA.so.5.6.0 and 5.6.1. If you looked at the previous step, we actually downloaded one of, that, one of those vulnerable versions. So this way, we know that while we may not, well, I don't have the private key that this attacker had, I can absolutely understand that when SSH runs, I can see that the bad, the bad library was being used. When you're done looking at this, we can go ahead and move into applying it. So in terminal, two, in terminal 1, let's go ahead and apply this policy. And then we are going to exec in to the Tetragon daemon set, and we're going to start watching for events. Now, Tetragon by default is going to just look for exact processes that are starting up, processes that are exiting. And so there's a bunch of data that we're just going to see kind of going by, doing stuff. Now, this is a, an abbreviated view of the events that we actually see inside of uh, with Tetragon. So every event is represented by a single line of data. But underneath it, there's like a whole structured JSON data that has a lot more context. Like who was the parent process? How what capabilities were that were and uh, were uh, available to that process at the time? A lot of that information is available. But we're going to leave this running in terminal one, and we're going to jump over to terminal two. And in terminal two, we're going to do a get nodes dash o wide, and we can see that the IP address of the kubelet running cube uh, kind control plane is 172.18.02. And because this is a Linux host, that IP address is reachable to us. If you were using Docker Desktop, this would be a much more difficult problem. But because we're actually in the same uh, routable network, because we're all here on Linux, it makes it a lot easier. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to SSH in. And when we see that fingerprint, we can say yes. And we should be able to see the date from inside of the container. And when we go back to terminal 1, we should, in a few seconds, be able to see the output that describes the memory map loading that dependency. And that event that's being generated is the event that helps us understand that this vulnerable code was loaded by the SSH binary. <clears throat> 
Now it may take a minute, because there's a lot of events that we're watching for. So sometimes the events are pretty noisy. So just give it a few, give it a few seconds or about you know, 30, 40 seconds looking for these event examples here where it says MMAP, R, etc. There we go. So there's our events from the previous run. Right there. We can see that there was an SSH uh, binary called inside of the kind control plane node. And that binary was actually you know, responding to 172.18.02 date, that, the date command. There's the process for re receiving that connection. And when that process that was receiving that connection started up, it loaded up the vulnerable versions of it loaded up a vulnerable version of libLZMA. And so we can use Tetragon to understand application dependencies that are loaded at runtime. And I ran it again, and I'm sure it'll show up again here in a minute. But so that's the first example of several examples in this lab. But in this example, we're seeing like, if you knew, if you came across the information that a particular library dependency was vulnerable, and you wanted to know across your fleet of machines that are running Tetragon, are, is that vulnerable library being loaded by any application? It doesn't have to be SSH, but is that, li is that vulnerable library being loaded? Then how can I create alerts for that? How can I actually start gathering those security events so that I know that those libraries, those vulnerable libraries are actually in use. And the interesting thing about this is that Tetragon looks at the Linux kernel. It's gathering this information from the Linux kernel. And that means that any process, whether containerized or not containerized, any anywhere that library is being loaded from could be loaded from inside of a container, could be loaded inside of the actual underlying host. You would actually get a lot more context about where that library was being used and by what. Right? So if you were to look at the event in greater detail, you'd be able to see the name of the container, the container image that was being used, all of that other stuff that was available to you. So when you're trying to understand what's happening at runtime, there's a lot more information that's available there. When you're done with that, you can hit check, and it will go ahead and do the check thing, and then we'll go on to our next step. And in the next section, we're going to explore a little bit of a different challenge. In this example, we're going to actually introduce a new feature in Tetragon, recent feature. This new feature allows us to write uh, policies, tracing policies, and have them affect only the pods within a given namespace or by pod selector. So if you knew what you were looking for, like in our example, what we're going to do is we're actually going to make it so that no application within the default namespace can reach beyond the RFC 1918 network space. Right, so we're basically going to write a Tetragon policy that will make it so that no process inside of the default namespace can connect to the outside world, just to other things within RFC 1918. But we only want to affect the default namespace. We don't want to affect all traffic. If I were to apply this network policy, if I were to write the, if I were to apply this tracing policy as uh, default tracing policy, that would mean that every process on this host, whether inside the kind control plane node or in the underlying host or anywhere else, would be affected by that policy. And I'm pretty sure, although I haven't tried it, I'm pretty sure that would break our access to this uh, lab environment, which is why we're doing the namespace thing, right? So because, we're, because we want to do this namespace element. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this policy And uh, really, OK, Whew. I thought it was empty. I was like, oh, uh. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this policy, and we'll talk about like what it's actually going to do. Right? So in this tracing policy, you can see right up at the top, instead of just saying tracing policy, it says tracing policy namespaced. And that means that whatever namespace I apply this tracing policy to will be affected by this policy. I have the name, and then I have the K probe that I'm going to use to affect this traffic. The first part here is actually walking, watching for 
the call TCP connect. <coughs> and when I see that call, it's a type socket. When I see that call, I want to look at the arguments for it. And if I see um, that one of the, the argument that I'm actually trying to connect to is not within any of these ciders, the 10, 8, the 172, 16, slash 12, the 192, 168, slash 16, or even the local host, 12700, slash 8. If it's not one of the IP addresses in that set, then I want to go ahead and move down to the match action section, and I want to kill that process. OK. That's what we're going to do. Let's try it out. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually deploy some stuff to play with. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and deploy an echo server. And an echo server is really just a tool that is going to allow us to like query it from inside of another pod so we can see that we have east-west traffic. And then we're also going to test north-south traffic. So let's go ahead and also run a Netshoot container. Netshoot, if you haven't heard of it, it's a great project. It's uh, somebody, Nico Laka, who's a, um, somebody is in the, has put up a Docker image called uh, Netshoot. And this Docker image really helps kind of diagnose or troubleshoot different networking problems from within a pod. So it's got things like TCP dump, it's got cube kettle, it's got a bunch of different tools. If you're trying to understand what the world looks like from within the pod, that might be a really helpful way of understanding what's happening there. Now, <clears throat> we haven't deployed anything yet, but once we've actually um, connected here, we can actually run our curl to uh, the, the echo server. And here's an example output of the echo server. And we know that the echo server is reachable because it's in the it's in the service namespace, and the service namespace or the service IP namespace is 10960016, right? So the res the resolution of this particular echo.default.cluster.local is 10961561086. In my case, it'll be different than yours, right? But that 1096 IP address space is within 10/8, which means that we're going to allow it when we apply the policy. If we were also, if you want, to curl google.com and type it correctly, you know, unlike me and my thumbs, we can see we can do that, right? We can curl google.com because we haven't applied any policy yet. So right now it's completely unrestricted. So that's working at the moment. So now that we've done that work, we're going to go ahead and exit the Nikolaka container. And when we do that, we're going to be back on the root shell. <coughs> and we're going to do that because the next thing we're going to do is apply that policy. So after you played around in, the, in that Netshoot container, you've proven that you have connectivity to the outside world and to the echo service, then we're going to go ahead and apply that policy that we took a look at earlier. And we're going to apply that to the default namespace. And then what, after applying the policy, we're going to start looking at events again. Now, one difference in this particular case is that I'm actually looking only at events that are happening in the default namespace. So I'm, not, I'm no longer looking at everything that's happening. In the previous example, I was like, just show me all the events. In this example, I want to only look at the events that are happening in the default namespace, because that's actually where things are interesting for our particular use case here. Once you get to this step, you want to go ahead and kick over to Terminal 2, where we will, again, play with the connectivity stuff. In Terminal 2, I can go ahead and exec back into the NetShoot container and do a curl. <coughs> 
sometimes these terminals get a little hung up. There's a little like uh, spinny here on the right next to the word terminal too, where you can say, um, where you can kind of reset the connection here. So let me try and uh, do that again. I don't think the container's gone. Yeah, terminal one. So cube kettle. Yeah. Our net shoot containers there. I think I'm just running into like a resource constraint problem or something. Interesting behavior. I'm wondering if I messed up the policy or something. We're not seeing the process get killed, so I don't think it's that. Deleting the policy and seeing if this changes anything. Mm -hmm. no, I'm not sure what's happening there. I feel like I have a problem that's deeper than the problem that I'm facing in the moment, unfortunately. Is anybody else having the same problem? Yeah. Everybody? Interesting. Super neat. The demo gods are coming for me. All right. Is, this a, is it DNS? What do you think? So I can exec in, and if I do host echo dot default dot svc, it does resolve. And kubeproxy is not is running by it's being run by kubeproxy, not by me. Selenium is installed here. Probably should be. Coordinates is running, Qproxy is running. What if I just tried to connect to this thing directly instead of Let's try that. Let's see if our problem is cube proxy or if it's actually the. Server is ten two forty four zero six. 
just bypass kube proxy. Ten. Oh, I know what I'm doing. Oh, it's so obvious. It's so dumb, it's brilliant. All right, here's what's happening. Net shoot, sorry. We're going to curl echo.default.svc. You actually have enough information to understand what happened, if you think about it. When I created the service, I said that the service was on port 88. I'm trying to curl port 80. There's nobody listening at port 80. So it will never work. Of course, there's a comma, because like, you know, that's, that's how I roll around here. So obvious. It's so it's so obvious. All right. So let's go ahead and put our name. I'm going to put my policy back. You may not have removed yours, but that was me trying to figure out like why this was not working. I'm going to put that back in there. I'm going to go ahead and start watching for events again. There we go. All right. So then I'm going to go back over to terminal two. I'm going to do a curl to the echo service on port 8080 and back into terminal one, I should be able to see those events. <coughs> Which I do, as I was expecting. I should be able to see those events, right? The curl connection and the, uh, and the response. <coughs> and so once the curl is, hap is, is successful, then we should see that process exit and everything's great. But what if we tried to connect to the outside world on something that actually listens on port 80? Because that might be a little bit more entertaining. Let's try that. And immediately, instead of trying to get anything else, I get killed. And again, if I go back to terminal one, I see a different output. I can see the connection, google.com. I can see that I'm actually mapping that to an IP address, 172, 253, 120, 138. That is outside of our IP ranges. And so Tetragon kills it. It sends a sig kill to that process. All right. So now, what's interesting here is that <coughs> what we've done is we've effectively kind of written network policy in Tetragon, which is maybe not exactly the right thing when you think about it from the Kubernetes perspective. Like within Kube, you have network policy, right? You probably should just be using network policy for this. But what if I put Tetragon on a database server? What if I put Tetragon on literally any other kind of Linux host? Well, then that actually might come in handy, right? Then I actually do have a reason to, think to, to use it this, in this way, right? It gives me the ability to apply rules somewhat arbitrarily as it relates to networking, as it, as it relates to processes running on that host. And I don't have to just watch for a particular, in that case, like I might apply this to any process running, or I might apply it to processes that are running in, with specific container names, right? If you go back to the docs here, the relevant Tetragon docs, which are in your fourth tab, I guess, you can actually see the policy, the motivation behind this particular rule set, and also like what policy filtering we can watch, we can watch for. So we can watch for, obviously, namespace policies. Any container running inside of that Kubernetes namespace will be affected by it. We can watch for pod label filters, which means that if you have labeled pods, egress OK, but other pods are not labeled egress OK, then you could actually affect it in that way. We can watch for container names, right? So if you were running this, if you're running Tetragon on a Docker host unrelated to Kubernetes, you could actually watch for container names and filter these things. And if you want to explore this like in your own time, not inside of this lab, there's also instructions here on how to actually play with that using Minikube. We got things to work, that's exciting. So now the next thing I wanted to do was show you kind of a deeper look at those events. You've heard me talk about them, but now I want to actually play with them a bit. So let's go ahead and do that. So 
let's go back to terminal one. Control C or refresh the terminal when we works. My control characters aren't actually making it into the terminal for some reason. We're going to run this command. <coughs> what we're doing here is we're actually getting into the Tetragon container. We're adding the JQ uh, command. And now we're watching for events. So back in terminal two, we will run our curl to echo. And in terminal one, should eventually see. Run that curl. Boop. And then over to terminal one, we should see the event show up. Say again? I keep running into it not being able to find Google.com hack. Oh. Yeah, the problem was that I had actually, um, I was still inside the container. So if you exit out to where you see the root, then you should be able to just run this girl co the, the the command again from here because the command is to exec into net shoot and then do the curl oh curl compact yeah, no, well it still works uh, yeah that's a typo on my part actually <laughs> I guess that's probably like word completion but it still it still functions because what we're actually looking at here is the event so we still see the event happen and this is what I was talking about by like there's a lot more context that's available to us than just that one line that says the curl connect happened, we killed the process, et cetera, right? And some of that data that's available to us is what the underlying PID was on the underlying host. Some of that information is like what um, command is being run, like what the effective capabilities were of, for that process, what pod labels were associated with the pod in which that process took place, what the parent process was, whether it was successful or not, what the actual, you know, like when you look at containers, containers are a group of namespaces. All of those namespaces are listed here. So we understand like exactly where that container is as it relates to the Linux kernel. So lots more context. And all of this being structured JSON data means that you can throw this into Splunk or into your SIM or whatever. And there's actually easy ways to understand contextually what's happening here. You can see a process tree. You can see a lot more information. So this last, this last piece was kind of like what I was referring to before. Like, did we just write network policy without applying network policy? And the answer is yes. But the reason is because we can actually do this in a variety of different ways, in a variety of different targets. When you get done, you can do a check, a check or a skip. I'm going to hit skip myself because I don't really want to spend the time. And the next thing we're going to do, is, the next thing we can get into is detecting a container escape, which is a different use case, right? So far we've talked about the XDSSH example. We've talked about the networking, uh, the RFC 1918 example. And the next one we're going to play with is detecting a container escape. Uh, the check is failing and I don't see skip. Let me come take a look. Yeah. 
Command terminated it. That's good. You expect to see that. Oh, yeah. to check that it working. Yeah, oh. and I don't get a skip. Let me, see. Let me figure out why that says. Check one moment. I figure out what I. I wrote this, and I, it, you know. So I also broke it. So one sec. We'll get you past it. So it's expecting the policy that is present to be called connect only private adders. And I think maybe that is our problem. Let me go back to the lab here. Connect only private adders. Yeah, the name is different. So what you can do to fix this, sorry, this is a bug in my lab. I apologize for this. You can actually edit the networking YAML and in the name, change the name to uh, connect-only-private dash ADDRS. And then once you've made that change, you can apply it. We can see that the pol policy has been applied. And then that should get you past it. Um, Yeah, the name is Connect Only Private ADDRS. Uh, the, let's see, where did I have that? What's your guess? Login. So the thing we're actually looking for is a policy that. My bad. Uh, despite my testing, it still gets me. All right, so then we go to. So we're looking for a namespaced policy that is named connect only, connect dash only dash private dash ADDRS. And if you just copy the namespace or the networking.yaml or edit the networking.yaml and change the name to connect dash only dash private dash ADDRS and then apply it, that should get you past the check. Sorry about that, that was my bad. Checks. We have about 25 minutes left. I don't think we're going to be able to get through all of the next piece of content in 25 minutes. Um, 
But like I said, this lab is open for three more days. I'll be wandering around, I'll be here, and then like also in the, at 1.15, I think, or 1.20 or something, I'm in the next room talking with Kyle Quest about uh, how to automate the obfuscation of CVEs. So that should be a fun talk if you're interested in that kind of thing. But I'll be there, I'll be here, I'll be walking around. Um, just look for the hat. And if you have questions or you're running into troubles, just come, get me, come, come, come find me. I'm happy to work through it with you. Um, I'm not leaving yet. I'm just saying that that's how you can get a hold of me. I'll also be on the floor tomorrow. So if you go into the solution showcase and you find the isovalent booth, that's where you'll find me tomorrow. I'll be hanging out with that colorful gentleman there in the back. <laughs> Our amazing EB, Mr. Jeff Spoletta. So once you've made that change, you should be able to move on to this next challenge, which is detecting a container escape. So I'm gonna keep walking through this content. I'm gonna pick my pace up a little bit so we can kind of move through it here a little bit. But um, the content is very self-based, very, very course-based. You know, you can actually work through all of this stuff and kind of play with it and see how it works. In this one, we start in Terminal 1. And the first thing we do <coughs> is we exec into uh, Tetragon in Terminal 1. And we start watching for pods that are called Sith Infiltrator. And in Terminal 2, we create a pod that's called that. Because we're starting to watch for events that are affected by that name, that we should be able to actually see that, the startup of that container here in a little bit. Here it goes. In Terminal 1, or in Terminal 2, we can kind of see if that pod was actually successfully deployed, and we know that it was because we started, started seeing events from it. In the next section here, again, we can kind of see all of the events for this particular pod, the startup. We can actually see the whole beginning of it, right? Like the actual process of starting this whole thing up. And these are all events that are very specific to this one particular pod. We can see the default configuration edits for the Nginx daemon. We can see the Nginx binary has been started up and is listening on port 80. <coughs> and the next thing we want to do is we want to add a tracing policy that will watch for privilege escalation. And again, any of these, any of these policies is available to you right there in that root file system. So if you want to look at that policy before you apply it, you can absolutely do that. Privilege escalation is basically the idea that, you know, in containers, we have network names, we have namespaces, not just network namespaces. We have PID namespaces, we have user namespaces. There's a bunch of different user, a bunch of different namespaces that make up a container. And in this particular example of privilege escalation, what we're going to play with is a command called nsenter, which allows you to change the effective namespace that you're in. This can be a great diagnostic tool, actually. If you're trying to understand what's wrong with an application inside of a container orchestration tool, like NSenter is a great tool for that. But at the same time, it requires quite a bit more privilege because you're basically allowing someone who can use NSenter to jump into the actual running application inside of other containers. It's very similar to Docker exec in that way, right? If you had the Docker exec command and NSenter, Docker exec is really just NSenter with like lipstick. It's the same thing, you know? <laughs> And the center lets you actually pick which namespaces you would jump into. Docker exec just tries to make it a very useful uh, user command. <clears throat> so now that we've actually created our policy for sit set NS, let's go ahead and try to see what happens next. Right? So our next command, we're going to jump into the Sith, Sith, the Sith infiltrator, and we should be able to see that bin bash command run down here at the bottom. And then while we're in there, 
we're going to use the nsenter command to escalate our privilege jump into the host namespace. The NSenter command in this particular case, what it's doing, you can actually even see that the name of the process changed a little bit, but you can see NSenter, which is the command that's like the, cat Swiss, it's like the Swiss Army knife of namespaces. I want to enter into all of the namespaces associated with PID1. So dash T means which PID. And because I'm not specified, I mean, and because I say dash A, it means I just want to be in all of the namespaces that PID1 is in, right? And to give you just a little bit more context, if I were to do ls slash proc slash one slash ns, and then do that with uh, dash al, because it will help you understand what's happening here. So here are the actual namespaces, the integers associated with the namespaces that PID1 is using. And here are all the namespaces that make up effectively that, that container or that process. In this particular example, what do you think the name of PID1 is on a running Linux host, generally? Anybody know? Four letter word? In it. The first process, right, is init. And so what we're doing is we're saying, I want to be in all of the namespaces that init is in. So effectively, we've just rooted this thing from within a container. Because the container that we created had the ability to in interact with host PID, and because the container is running in a privileged fashion, we can immediately exit the namespaces that the container is running into and jump right into just like connecting to this thing as root. Yeah. But every process in Linux is actually, if you were to do this like proc, ls minus al proc, proc pid ns, you're going to be able to see the namespaces that every process is in. And if you look at a container, the real difference between a container and any other process running on a Linux, on a Linux kernel is that those numbers will be different. Right? That's the only real difference. If you look at like a process that's been containerized, like the Nginx process, you're going to find that the actual network namespace of that process will be different than the one that is associated with PID1 because it was started just for that container. Say again? If you, if you jump into another terminal and show the same thing, you can show that they're using Yeah, I mean, I will, leave, I will leave that to you to explore, but that is how it works. <clears throat> so let's take a look at our events. Did we catch it? Looks like we did. Right, we saw the change. <clears throat> we can do a check to make sure everything passes, and then we can move on to the next step. Once we have actually managed to take over an underlying host, just getting access is one thing, but it'd be kind of cool if we could stay there. Like we could figure out how to make it a persistent threat as opposed to just our current model, which is like we got in, but like how do we actually make this more persistent? So the first thing we're going to do, just from our, particular, our perspective, is we're going to write a tracing policy that will detect an invisible pod. Now this is a Interesting thing within the Kubernetes project, or actually within the kubelet specifically. So the kubelet, actually probably in service of another project within the Kubernetes ecosystem called kubeadm, the kubelet is, can create what's called a mirror pod. A mirror pod is a pod that is specified on disk at a particular path, usually Etsy Kubernetes manifests. If you put a manifest inside of that directory path and you're running kubeadm, then the kubelet is configured to start any container defined within that path and to manage the lifecycle of those containers or of those pods entirely on its own. So the kubelet is responsible for the creation of this pod 
and also for registering this pod with the Cube API server. But if it can't register it because there's no namespace associated, because the namespace you specified in that YAML, right, then it will just keep running in perpetuity. It'll keep trying to register it until that namespace exists. It will never actually show up. You'll never be able to see that it's there. This is an interesting bug in Kubernetes that we've never actually fixed, but <laughs> it's, but it actually, uh, it illustrates an interesting challenge. The reason this is even possible is because kubeadm, when it's starting up, it needs some way to start the API server initially. It needs some way to start the controller manager initially, like, and the, uh, and the scheduler. So if you look at a control plane node that's operated by kubeadm, and you look at Etsy Kubernetes manifest, you're gonna see the API server there, the controller manager, and the scheduler. You may even see etcd depending on how, on how that's actually being managed. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and add that tracing policy, like I said. Again, feel free to, um, <coughs> excuse me. Again, feel free to uh, take a look at that policy if you'd like. And then let's go ahead and apply or create our um, invisible pod. So in terminal two, let's exec into our Sith infiltrator. We'll NS enter back into the underlying host file system, network namespace, PID namespace, everything. Like if I do PS minus EF, I can see all the processes, etc. Let's move into the SC Kubernetes manifest directory. And there we have it. Those are the files I was referring to before. There's the etcd. This is actually the kubelet that's running on the control plane is managing the life cycle of these pods. And although we see them, if I do kubectl get pods, I'll be able to see them. It's only because the kubelet was successful in registering them with the API server. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create our invisible pod. And you'll note that the namespace, it's uh, namespace doesn't exist. It does and it doesn't exist, right? So again, this will actually get started and it will run in perpetuity in the background. The kubelet will keep it alive. If it were to die, it will get recreated if we're on the underlying host, we can see that it was created, right? There's our hack latest container running. But we did create a tracing policy that should allow us to catch this right, this creation. Do we see it? Right, here's another example of Tetragon showing us a lot more context about what's happening at that layer, right? So we saw the write of the file, and with Tetragon and with Cilium, anything you can observe, you can also enforce. Get to our check, move on to the next section. This is another attack. So it's a slightly different attack, but it kind of jumps into another one of the interesting ways of interacting with this stuff. So let's, let's walk through it. In this example, again, we're gonna be watching for events in terminal one. In terminal three, we're gonna jump into our Sith infiltrator. We're gonna jump into the host namespace. We're going to figure out the hack latest container ID. We're going to exec into hack latest. So now we're sitting inside of that container that is a persistent container being operated by the kubelet. In terminal one, where we were watching for the events, right? We can see the escalation of privileges. We can see the exec into the process. 
in Terminal 2, we're going to go ahead and run a different command. And in this case, we're going to be watching for uh, process names. Right? So we're, watching, we're, we're looking at all of the events, and we're looking for process names that include the word curl or the word Python. And now back to our hidden, our tucked away secret container world, and we'll run the curl command. Back into terminal two, and we should see here in a minute the curl and the Python command running. Sometimes these take a little longer, but they do actually, but all of the events are there. So there's our curl command. You can see what the arguments were. And we can now see that we have passed the output of that directly into a Python process. And that Python process is currently running. Lots more context about what's happening at runtime, about what's happening inside the Linux kernel. So the next thing we're going to do is, like I was saying before, anything you can observe, you can also enforce. So what if we wrote a policy that would not allow writing to the path Etsy Kubernetes manifests, right? Because we know that it's restricted. Now, the interesting thing about this, this actually points out a problem, I mean, a, a, a feature of eBPF, which I think is super interesting, right? When I write these policies and I apply them, it's from the moment that I apply them that they take effect. So that API server, the controller manager, the scheduler manifests that are sitting in that directory, they're already there. And those are fine. I want them to be there. But after those things are there, I don't want anything else to be able to write to that directory without my explicit permission. So I can apply this policy after those things are up and running, apply this policy, and now after that policy is written, nothing else can put stuff in there that I don't want to be there. Right? It gives me the ability to change the security posture I have after things that I actually care about being present are present. Another example of this is whenever you're running a container orchestrator like Docker or Container D, there are a number of system calls that you have to allow because the Container D process needs them. One of those system calls is actually called set UID, which is a very risky syscall because it allows you to change the permission of a particular pro, um, a binary. Now, in creating the container, it makes sense. You might need that. But at runtime, do you need that? Would you want to be notified? Hey, somebody who even, you know, you've written a setcom policy that says you can't, you have to be able to use set UID. So I've enabled set UID to be used, but I want to know when somebody's using it outside of that container D process, right? There's another great example of this, right? What if you could write a policy that says, don't use, don't use set UID after, after the process has started, as opposed to having to change the security posture of that process and having to restart that process once that security posture has changed, you can apply this dynamically. What are you doing? No sleeping. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and work through this. So what we're doing right now is we're going to go ahead and apply a match actions stanza to this process. Because before we were able to see that it happened, but now we want to actually stop it from happening. And match actions is going to line up, as you can see on the right here, 
it's going to line up basically at the same level as match arcs. Has to be the same level, same depth as match arcs. And the, and the thing we're going to add is match actions. You see our changes are saved up here at the top. Go back to terminal one and let's apply it. We boop on down to the next section. Again, in Terminal 1, let's go ahead and run the command to watch for events from this particular pod. In Terminal 2, let's exec in. We'll do our NS Center. That's still allowed. We didn't drop that. We can move into the target directory, and it doesn't allow us. And if we go back to our events, we can see the process being killed or being overridden. And that, my friends, is everything I had to show you today.